Hey everybody, this is Marty Kessler for BibleTalk.tv and this is the third in a series of lessons on apologetics. The word apologetics, by the way, doesn't mean we're sorry for anything we've done. It simply is a word that originally meant an explanation. The apologetics are, it's the, uh, the, the aspect of explaining things as they are. And so we're looking at uh, lessons that explain things the way we see things from the Bible point of view. This particular lesson deals with uh, characters in the Chinese language. I call it ancient Chinese secret, but actually these things are no secret at all for anyone who wants to do the research. It's right there to be seen, to be learned, to be discovered. And we're talking about in this lesson 21 different characters that perfectly parallel the story of the Bible in the first several chapters. So let's get on with our lesson and let's start first with Genesis chapter 11 verses 8 and 9 which says this, so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name is called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. You'll notice I highlighted the idea of scattering the people. This is following the flood, when all the people of the earth had gathered in one spot, and they were building a tower up to heaven, as it were, and God said, well, the population has grown to the point where they're doing things they shouldn't be doing and they aren't going to be good. And so to scatter them, He confused their languages, and that's why that place was called Babel. They couldn't understand what each other was saying, and so they would separate off into groups based on those they could understand. And we are looking today, of course, at the people who evidently migrated from Babel to the land we now call China and became the people we now call the Chinese people. Let's take a look at this historical timeline. Most of us, when we think about China, we think about uh, Buddha and Buddhism, as today the Chinese are primarily Buddhist. But Buddha didn't come into the Chinese culture until about 600 BC, as you can see from that graph. About 1900 years prior to that, however, their language was written down, 2500 years uh, B.C. coincides very well with what would have been the date of the Tower of Babel and the scattering of the people. And at that time, they were monotheistic. The Chinese people were monotheistic. They worshipped one God. And that one God was known as Shangdi or Shangdai. I'm not sure how they would pronounce it, but we have it written out in English letters there. And I will simply, for the sake of this study, refer to that God as Shangdi. So we've got Shengdi or Shengdai, and we also have this from Genesis chapter 17, verse 1. Now when Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless. So we're talking about the Chinese culture, but here we're looking back at Hebrew culture and the, the progenitor of the Hebrew race, Abram. And I highlighted in this particular text the, the words that refer to God. The Lord appeared to Abram, and that word Lord is the Hebrew word Yahweh. And we also have in this same text, in English, God Almighty, which in Hebrew is El Shaddai. So we've got El Shaddai for the Hebrews, but we have Shangdi or Shangdai for the Chinese. Is Shangdi, Shangdai, is that El Shaddai? You can see how the names sound and look very similar as they're written out, of course, in English characters, in English letters. And it, it's, a, it's a, quite a coincidence if this is not the same person. Of course, names change a little bit from one language to the other. We understand how the name Jesus was not originally pronounced like we pronounce it in English. In Greek, it would have been Iesus. In Hebrew, it would have been Joshua or something like that. The Hebrews would still pronounce it differently, but that's how we pronounce Joshua in English, and it's the same name as Jesus. To a Hispanic person, the name Jesus would be Jesus. So we know that one name can be pronounced different ways, and that's why it makes perfect sense to see Shangdi as Shaddai. The Hebrews were monotheistic, and the Chinese initially were monotheistic. They both worshipped one god, and their God had a very similar name and may well have been, I believe it was, the same God. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, 
We've got the Hebrews worshiping one God and the Chinese worshiping one God. And this is what we read from Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. One God is what the Hebrews believed in. One God is what the Chinese originally believed in. And here we have the Chinese character for heaven. And that character is made up of two other characters, one for great and the other, a slash mark or hash mark, representing one. And so we have the great one. He is in heaven. And that's how the Chinese would express the idea of heaven, as it is the place of the great one, the one God in whom they believed and called Shang Di. And then we have from Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, this reading, In the beginning... God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was formless and void, and darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was moving over the surface of the waters. This Chinese character, which looks rather busy, is the character for spirit. And that character is made up of many other smaller characters. We've got the character for one, and then the character representing cover or roof, and then we have water represented with the next character. And then three of the same representative images that mean person. Person, person, person. Three people. Isn't that interesting? And all of that, when you add works of magic, comes out to mean the Spirit. We understand that the Spirit of God did not work magic, but He was supernatural uh, a universe was created in which there are natural laws, but God, of course, works above nature. And everything God does that is above nature could be referred to as magic, though technically it's not magic. It's a different kind of force, a different kind of power outside of nature. But isn't it interesting, fascinating to me, that this character for spirit is made up first of the character one, under one roof, united, and water is involved, and there are three other or three people in total, which is the idea of the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit that we see represented in the Hebrew Bible. So the Chinese have that same idea, that same concept in their character for spirit. And you might recall that Jesus said, God is a spirit, and those who worship Him must do so in spirit and truth. So... This is the same message, whether we're looking at it from the Hebrew or from the Chinese. The next character we'll look at is the character for create. In Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7, we read about how God made the first man. It says, The Lord God formed man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. So this is a symbol for create. We have the character representing speak, and then dust or mud. The character for life, a small hash mark, and then the character representing walk. And these characters put together mean to create, which makes perfect sense from the standpoint of Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. God creates man. He speaks into the dust life, and that man walks. Man became a living being, a living soul, perfectly paralleling the Chinese character or the Chinese character perfectly paralleling Hebrew, they both match so well. The next character we'll look at is the word for first from Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 to 8. We just read verse 7. Let's add verse 8 to it. The Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there He placed the man whom He had formed. So we've got the character representing first, being a combination of the small hash mark, which means living, and dust and man. The living dust that is man is the character put together, all those characters put together mean first. And we're looking at the first man, and he's put in a garden. So we see next this idea of happiness in the Chinese characters. That is another busy character, but we have in that character God, represented by the interesting-looking uh, artwork there, I would call it. 
and the, the sign for life, and then man, and then there comes the garden. This is the Chinese character representing happiness. And what could represent happiness better than man in the garden in fellowship with God? That's how the Hebrew writers put it down, and that's how we see it in the Chinese language. From Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, we read this. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. The Chinese character you see there represents the idea of necessary. And the character is created by combining three other characters, or four other characters rather. The hash mark representing one, the character for man, the enclosure, and then a new character we've not seen before representing woman. So we've got necessary being one man in a garden and a woman. The woman was necessary. God looked at man being alone and he says, not good for the man to be alone. Something else is necessary. And he created the woman and that completed the arrangement, completed the family, made the first marriage. And all of that is wrapped up in this concept of necessary. God bringing the woman to the man in the enclosure, in the garden. Genesis chapter 2, verses 21 to 22, we read this. So the Lord caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God fashioned into a woman the rib which he had taken from the man and brought her to the man. So the woman's been brought to the man, and she is the final crowning part of his creation. Everything is done. He's not going to create anything else or anyone else. He makes the first man and he makes the first woman from the man and brings her to the man and now God's creation is finished. And so we see in this Chinese character the idea of two people being first and then first is represented by uh, home and that stands for complete or the character for complete is represented through the idea of first and home. And all of this perfectly combines with the Genesis account to give us two parallel ideas. The Chinese characters telling us the story that was first written down by the Hebrews, by, the, by Moses in the Hebrew Bible. Let's move on to our next character, which is representing the beginning. Of course, Genesis chapters 1 and 2 tell all about the beginning. But in Matthew chapter 19, Jesus, the Son of God, makes reference to the beginning with regard to marriage. And he says, in the beginning, God made them male and female. And so we see here the Chinese character for beginning, which is a combination of this two hash marks representing two people. And, and people, of course, shows us that those marks represent people. So we've got the beginning represented by this idea of two people. Two people were the beginning. One man couldn't be the beginning. He couldn't be fruitful. He couldn't multiply. He couldn't have children. But a man with a woman, there, now you have a beginning. And that's how the earth was populated. And we all go back to our beginning with Adam and Eve. So we've got this text from Matthew 19 where Jesus addresses this idea of the beginning. He answered and said, Have you not read that he who created them from the beginning made them male and female? And so when Jesus was asked about marriage, he goes back to the beginning. And the Chinese spoke of the beginning as two people. Isn't that interesting? Here we have the Chinese character representing the idea of forbidding or warning. And that character is made up of two characters. One character is two trees. And that's combined with God to give the idea of warning. And in Genesis chapter 2, verses 16 and 17, says, The Lord God commanded the man, saying, From any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. So God is giving Adam warning. There are two trees. You can eat from one, but you can't eat from the other. And so this Chinese symbol represents that truth very well, that bit of history that we read in the book of Moses. Next we have 
the character representing the devil from chapter 3 and verse 1. We read this, Genesis 3, 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said, you shall not eat from any tree of the garden. So this is the character representing the devil. He's spoken of as the serpent here, but we know from further reading in the, in the Bible that that serpent was the devil. And this character, devil, is made up of the Chinese character for secret, life, man in the garden. And so the devil comes secretly to the man or actually to the woman first in the garden and leads Eve astray. And her life is put in danger by what the devil encourages her to do and what she does in fact do. And man joins her in that. And so we have this once again parallel in this character for the devil. Next is the character for tempter. The devil is the one who tempted Eve. We have this idea of secret plus man in the garden and they are alive. That's what that small hash mark represents and all that together represents the devil. He is very much alive, but he threatens our lives by what he does. And we have also this idea of tempter represented in the characters uh, there in addition of the devil, the trees, and a covering. He is the tempter. So we have another parallel in the Chinese language that coincides with what we read in the Hebrew Bible. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 6, we read here that the woman coveted or lusted after the fruit. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her and he ate. So the Chinese character for to covet or to desire is two trees with a woman. Where in the world would they get the idea for coveting being associated with two trees and, and a woman if not from the third chapter of Genesis? Once again, it's an unmistakable parallel. Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, we read about Adam and Eve hiding. It says, They heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the cool of the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They're hiding among the trees of the garden. So this Chinese character representing hide is made up of three characters, a body, and then several, and then trees. So here are Adam and Eve hiding their bodies among several trees. That's what Genesis 3.8 tells us. They heard God walking in the, in the cool of the garden and the cool of the day, and they were afraid because they had eaten the forbidden fruit, and so they hid themselves among the several trees, the many trees. That's what Genesis tells us, and that's what this Chinese character represents. Where else would they get that idea if not from Genesis chapter 3? Continuing in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 16, we read this. To the woman, he said, this is God pronouncing punishments for eating the fruit. I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain you will bring forth children, yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. So we've got this Chinese character representing pain and sorrow, which is the combination of two trees plus the symbol for under and then man. So we've got the two trees and of course Eve ate from one of those trees and then gave to her husband and he ate. And part of her punishment is that she will be under her man. She will be, her desire will be to her man. She will be subservient to him. That's the idea. That wasn't the original plan of God, but that's the way it's arranged now because of sin coming into the world. And we see this in the Hebrew Bible. We see it represented perfectly in this Chinese character. Pain and sorrow, two trees, and the idea of subservience to man. Genesis chapter 3, verses 17 to 19. Let's read this together. It says, Then Adam to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten from the tree about which I commanded you, saying you shall not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. Both thorns and thistles it shall grow for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you will eat bread till you return to the ground, because from it you were taken 
for you are dust and to dust you shall return. That's Genesis 3, 17 to 19. And so this idea of a promise, of setting something down that it's going to be certain, you're promising it's going to be so, that's the Chinese character represented by the combination of words and man and weeds and life and earth. All of these elements are combined in this Chinese character, which come right off the page of Genesis chapter 3. God spoke the words to man, his condemning words, that he would have weeds to contend with, and he would earn the bread of his life by the sweat of his brow as he works hard to bring a living from the earth. All of that is right there in that character. And God promises, he promises Adam that this is the way it's going to be now, because of what you have done, because of your sin. Very fascinating. Genesis chapter 3, verses 22 to 24, we read this. The Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil, and now he might search, reach out his strand, stretch out his hand, and take also from the tree of life, and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the Garden of Eden to cultivate the ground from which he was taken. So he drove the man out, and at the east of the Garden of Eden he stationed the cherubim and the flaming sword, which turned every direction to guard the way to the tree of life. So here's the Chinese character for guarding. It's made up of three characters. The man, and in this case that symbol represents entrance, and then we have the symbol for tree. So the man is guarded from entering to the tree. That's exactly what we see in Genesis 3, and that's what is represented in this Chinese character. Interesting that the idea for guarding involves a tree and keeping a man away from that tree, which is what we read here. The next character is for violent or cruel. And in Genesis chapter 4, verses 8 to 15, we read the story of Cain and Abel, and eventually we'll get down to Lamech. And Lamech is a descendant of Cain's, and he will claim that if he is uh, put upon by anyone, he will avenge himself seven times. That's the story we read in Genesis chapter 4, 8 to 15. I encourage you to look at that account yourself. So in the Chinese language, we have the character representing violent or cruel, which is a combination of murder, the symbol for murder, and man, a man is murdered, of course. And then we've got symbol for mouth, man, and seven. All of that goes together to combine and make the idea for violent or cruel. This is what we see in Genesis 4, 8 to 15. And this is what we see represented in this Chinese character for violence or cruelty. Another parallel. In Genesis chapter 6, verses 13 to 18, we read about the flood that came in Noah's day. And you may be familiar with this story. You can, you can easily read it from Genesis chapter 6 if you have a copy of the scriptures available. You can read how God came to Noah and found him righteous of all the people on the earth. Noah was married, of course, and he had three sons who had uh, each had a wife uh, when the story plays out. And so we see God telling Noah to build a boat, to build an ark, and all of his family would be saved on that boat. And so the Chinese character for boat, I hope you find this as interesting as I do, it's a vessel with eight people in it. Why in the world would the symbol for boat wind up having eight people in it if that idea did not come from Genesis chapter 6? Genesis chapter 6, we've got the first uh, record of a boat, God telling Noah to build an ark, and he builds that ark, and that ark turns out to be the salvation for himself, his wife, his three sons and their wives. Eight people saved on a boat. That's the Chinese symbol for boat. We have next from Genesis chapter 7, the idea of a flood. And you can read about the flood in Genesis 6 and 7. And the Chinese symbol for flood is with the symbol water, and total, this idea of total or totality. And so you've got uh, the symbol for together and earth and eight, eight all put together to refer to the idea of a flood. Isn't that fascinating 
that the Chinese symbol for flood incorporates all of these elements. This idea, of course, of water, but the totality. God says that the waters covered all of the earth 21 feet over the highest peak, whatever the peak was then that was the highest. The water covered 21 feet above that peak, and there were eight people together uh, above the earth in the ark. All of these elements coming together once again to parallel the story we find in Genesis. Genesis chapter 11, back to the Tower of Babel. We've got the Chinese symbol for confusion, which is made up of two characters, one character meaning tongue and another one for mystery. And it would be easy to conclude why they would put those characters together to talk about confusion. We've got languages and for some mysterious reason, we can't understand each other now. That's exactly what happened in Babel. God confused the languages in order to scatter the people. And so confusion is represented by tongues and a mystery. And perhaps part of the mystery is, why can't I understand you? So we've got another parallel now this time from Genesis chapter 11 and the concept of Babel. And then we have the, kind, uh, the Chinese concept for West. And what we have for West is the symbol for one and man in an enclosure. That's what that symbol represents, one man in an enclosure. Think about that. The Chinese moved eastward from where the garden would have been. And now their symbol for West is represented by where they came from, one man in a garden. Where else would they get the idea for West to be one man in a garden if not from the account given in Genesis? Righteousness. This is an interesting character indeed. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 4, we read this. Abel on his part also brought of the firstlings of his flock and of their fat portions, and the Lord had regard for Abel and for his offering. So Abel is making an offering and we understand that sacrifices were made because of sin. And that's why Jesus came. He was the Lamb of God given to take away the sins of the world. So we've got this concept of righteousness in the Chinese represented by, first of all, the character for sheep. Sheep, an animal. That's what Abel was offering. He was offering up from his flock. That's what Jesus is called, the Lamb of God. And then we have the symbol for me, myself. And then we have... Interestingly enough, the Chinese symbol for hand and knife. You take a knife in your hand, you slay the sheep, and that brings righteousness to me. That's the idea. You must have a sacrifice to offer for yourself. That's what Abel was doing, and that's what God has done for us. Jesus has become our sacrifice. He's the one who's offering up provides for our righteousness. We have no righteousness of our own, but His righteousness is now conferred on us through faith. And that's exactly what Genesis is teaching. That's what all of the Bible leads us to believe about Jesus. And that's what we see represented in this Chinese character for righteousness, including a sheep and me and a knife in my hand. That's pretty neat as it comes together. John, the baptizer, says the next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And that very idea is perfectly incorporated in this Chinese symbol for righteousness. What have we seen in just these 21 words? Well, we've seen the idea of monotheism and the practice that the Chinese originally had of worshiping only one God. We've seen the spirit nature of God that God is a spirit. We've seen the triune nature of God, that there are three in what we would call the Godhead, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, as they're represented to us in the Bible. We've seen man created from dust, which is exactly what Genesis chapter 2 tells us. We've seen the creation of woman to complete the man. We've seen the garden. We've seen the two trees that were in the garden. We've seen the tempter and Satan. We've seen the flood with eight people saved. We've seen the confusion of languages and that confusion taking place back to the west where the garden was. We've seen sacrificing for righteousness and, and we've seen more than this. Isn't it fascinating 
that when we look at the Chinese language and the characters therein, we see the story of Genesis perfectly represented. What this shows us is the conclusion is ancient, but it's no secret. The worship of God, whether he is called Shangdi or El Shaddai, is neither Western nor is it Middle Eastern, but this worship is universal and it is for all mankind and it has been for all mankind from the beginning. That's what we see in this language. Thank you for listening.